10 parameters, so request the first one. Please don't be shy to press the Dana button. Okay. That's how we show our appreciation to our teacher. Uh, Geshema, we're very uh, grateful. Thank you so much for this teaching. And uh, we're very, very happy for this uh, opportunity. We are indeed extremely lucky, very, very fortunate. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you, Laura. Okay, so let's start. Uh, just focusing on the breath. Mindfulness of the breath. And then let's visualize Buddha Shakyamuni in the space in front of us. Who appears as a manifestation of all the enlightened qualities. Guiding and inspiring us. and inseparable from our Lama. And the Buddha is surrounded by the great masters of the Nalanda tradition of Tibet and of other great other Buddhist countries. Or other Buddhist traditions. Just try to feel the presence, their presence in the space in front of you. serving as inspiration and an object of refuge. And then also visualize that you're surrounded by all sentient beings. That wherever you look around you, there are sentient beings suffering. Being controlled by their self-grasping and self-centeredness. completely unaware of their great potential and of the actual nature of their mind.
And then while focusing on all sentient beings, generate affectionate love. A sincere feeling of care, affection, and closeness towards all sentient beings. And then becoming particularly aware of the different types of suffering and their causes that sentient beings constantly have to experience. Generate great compassion. type of affection that wishes for all sentient beings to be free from their suffering and its causes. And aspires to be able to protect each and every sentient being from suffering and its causes. that wants to help them, to guide them towards a state free from suffering. And as that aspiration grows stronger, it gives way to the altruistic attitude. Type of determination to do whatever is necessary, irrespective of how, of how long it may take. to lead sentient beings to a state free from suffering and its causes. Since that is only really possible once we become fully enlightened, generate the mind of enlightenment, the wish, the aspiration to become completely enlightened for the welfare of all sentient beings. Not for our own benefit, but to be really able to benefit others. Through leading them to enlightenment. And think that it's also with this motivation that we continue to study Chattakirti's entering into the middle way. And then without letting go of our motivation, let's recite the prayers. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By the accumulation of merits of practicing generosity and so forth, may I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By the accumulation of merits of practicing generosity and so forth, 
may I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By the accumulation of merits of practicing generosity and so forth, may I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. to deepen our love and compassion for all sentient beings. May all sentient beings have happiness and the causes of happiness. May all sentient beings be free from suffering and the causes of suffering. May all sentient beings never be separated from happiness that is free from suffering. May all sentient beings abide in equanimity, free from attachment for friends and hatred for enemies. And then focusing on the Buddhas, the Buddha in front of us and great beings around him. Reverently I prostrate with my body, speech and mind. I present every type of offering, actual and imagined. I declare all my negative actions accumulated since beginning this time. and rejoice in the merit of all holy and ordinary beings. Please remain until the end of cyclic existence and turn the wheel of Dharma for living beings. I dedicate my own merits and those of others to the great enlightenment. All right, so continuing to, continuing to um, practice method and wisdom together. So again, uh, bodhicitta, of course, in all our work on a daily basis, especially when it gets challenging, Starting off, of course, the first thing we should do in the morning, as His Holiness uh, always advises us to do, first thing in the morning, generate the mind of enlightenment. Uh, of course, making sure that it's love and compassion that are the driving forces for the aspiration to become fully enlightened. And then to throw out the day, especially when we encounter a well, challenging situation, people challenging us, situations challenging us, to remember, why am I here? Why am I doing what I'm doing? In that way, actually, our ordinary, just ordinary, normal actions, they become spiritual actions because our motivation is that whatever we do become a cause for the enlightenment, well, our own enlightenment for the benefit of all sentient beings. So that's one part of it. But as I said last time, in terms of bringing together method, so bodhicitta and um, wisdom together, well, as we started uh, as part of the dharma or the, the, the aspects to reflect on here, well, the suffering aspects, the fact that we ourselves and other sentient beings experience suffering, experience suffering as on a daily basis. So here, all sentient beings, that's our focus in terms of uh, aspiring to become enlightened, but then to alternate between that mind and the understanding that there's so much suffering around us. Of course, the suffering of suffering, that is easily recognized, but even the happiness that we perceive, that we usually identify as happiness, well, it is a type of happiness, but its actual nature is suffering in that it doesn't last it's not 
the deepest level of suffering that our mind can experience. And um, before long, if we continue, or if other sentient beings continue with the object, whatever gives them that kind of pleasure, well, it'll turn into suffering. And on an even deeper level, to be aware of the fact that our mind and body are in the nature of suffering such that suffering comes easily, naturally, for any kind of relief. So what we describe as happiness, we have to make an effort, we have to work hard. So that's just our situation. If we just lie down and don't do anything, be hungry, thirsty, we start getting sticky and smelly and our body will start to ache. So our life is I'll define where our life is characterized by a lot of hard work, a lot of hardships. And one of the characteristics of a Buddha is that whatever Buddha does is spontaneous, effortless. So in a sense, our life is, and the life of the other sentient beings, of course, is characterized by this uh, hard work we actually have to apply. Anyway, so to reflect on this, this is our predicament. This is the predicament of all sentient beings. But since we focus on mainly the welfare of all sentient beings, well, then the wish, of course, for all these beings to be free from um, these types of sufferings that is just described, then, of course, the wish to become enlightened in order to be able to free sentient beings in that way. All right, so that's for this coming week. And then again, I got some questions. So I quickly want to go through them. Uh, there's still something from last time there's still one question or isn't really a question so much but anyway it's from Tao Seti um he sent me a pdf file that um Dali can make available if she wants about overcoming self overcoming nihilism um there's a way to make it available um so there's that and then he says um he just kind of commented on a few verses. So verse 224 in chapter, six chapter, verse 224, there's a line, he says, that reads that the three realms in the entirety are unborn from the very start. And through the force of conventional truth, he journeys, the Bodhisattva journeys to cessation. So he's really just commenting on it, saying it's incredible how... <clears throat> Um, how it becomes kind of clear to him that the true truth, so as they're described, so the ultimate truth on one hand, but the conventional truth on the other, they're not like opposites in that one cannot, if you have if you have one, you can't have the other, but rather they're two levels of reality. So they're like uh, two poles, or I would say like two perspectives of reality. Um, so that's one uh, comment, and I, I totally agree with him on that. And then he also says in verse in chapter eight, verse one, um, he talks about Zongsa uh, Kinsu he, he mentions Zongsa Kinsu comment saying that the statement in terms of being the past, so it's the one gone uh, afar or gone afar, the, the eighth womb is called gone afar, that this is. Um, a, a term in the past so he finds i think he says it's like a he finds that contradictory or something it seems to end with a contradiction oh no that's something else anyway so he's saying that so i looked it up actually if you're interested um there is this commentary like he said madhyamika avatar it's um the type i mean if you look at the what's the title i think it's called oh yeah introduction to the middle way by it's a very extensive commentary on exactly the same text we're studying. Uh, Chandrakirti is uh, entering the middle way or Madhyamika Atara, Madhyamika Vatara. And um, the verses are a little, I mean, uh, it's a different translation that he uses. Um, it's not by Tupdin Jimba, but anyway, I'm just going to page to the page Tal City is mentioning, which is uh, 363 in the text I got. Is that right? Is that the right page? No, 341. That's it's 341. And here was um Zongse Kenzurumshi says, oh, by the way, you can get this online. Uh, if you Google it, if you Google um Zongse Kenzurumbuchi uh 
introduction to the middle way. There's a PDF file we can download. It's for free. Anyway, he says, um, this is one place where the Madhyamika Avatara becomes quite complicated. The name of this stage is far advanced or far gone. Okay, so this is what he mentions. It is in this, it is in past tense, so already past. In the root text, it is written moment by moment, the Bodhisattva enters into cessation. So really all it's saying, he's describing, or he's explaining in the first two lines of um, verse number one of the first verse in the seventh chapter. Well, on the first Bhumi, the first Bhumi is the far gone. So far gone in the sense, already having reached, having far, have, having advanced far. So it's really just saying it's not, I mean, of course, he's also advancing, the Bodhisattva is also advancing, but having come thus far. And then he goes on to say he's, that the Bodhisattva enters the cessation again and again. I mean, enters the cessation and, of course, is able to arise or exit from it again and again as well. So, yeah, I mean, I, I don't think there's any contradiction here, if that's what, what Tao City meant. So, yes, he's come that far. So just from the point of view of how far he's come. And he continues to enter into meditative equipoise or meditative absorptions. And of course, he's able on that level to not just enter a meditative absorption, but also in one moment, in one short moment, he's also able to exit from it as well. So such is his mental agility, what we discussed before. All right. Um, and then he also tells it, he says then with regard to the eighth chapter in the first verse, um, but here he says this seems to end with a contradiction when he says, the Bodhisattva's aspirations become perfectly refined and he'll be roused by the Buddhas from his cessation. So on one hand, I guess he's saying that his aspirations have become completely, have become completely refined, but still he has to be roused by the Buddhas. Um, well, I guess it's just the pull of uh, the bliss, the bliss of um the meditative absorption, especially when the afflictive emotions are gone. Um, and I'm not sure this is necessary for every bodhisattva, but maybe for, for a, a number of bodhisattvas, they may remain longer in this absorption than necessary. So, I mean, they haven't reached this, the level of a Buddha yet or not even the eighth or ninth level. So I guess uh, there's no contradiction that there's still this help needed and anyway, help is needed all the way up to enlightenment from, I mean, assistance is needed from Buddhists and Bodhisattvas. All right. So anyway, those were Tao Seti's kind of comments or kind of, well, less questions, more like comments. All right. And then there are questions again from the Israeli group. The first one is, what is the cost for each of the two minds? What are the two minds? I'm not sure what the two minds are. Uh, what I meant with the two minds. What is the cause for each of no, the two? No, it was it was a beginning of question which I didn't complete. You talked about the two minds of the Bodhisattva meditative uh, meditative uh, mind. In one of them, he um, perfect perfects the parameters, and one of them deepens the uh, wisdom. And uh, I was going to ask. Uh, what, what is the cause for each of them? Alternatively, he uses one. Then I thought about an answer, but I, I asked the questions anyway. Okay. So when you say the two minds, you mean method and wisdom, the mind of method no. and the mind of wisdom? No. You, no. you said that he had a um, uh, mind of um, meditative... Um, Equipoise or as absorption? Absorption in which he... Uh, uh, deepen the wisdom part and other mind uh, in which he uh, works on the uh, parameters. Oh, the non-absorbed. So um, I talked about two kinds of minds. Once a bodhisattva has reached the path of seeing, there are those minds or 
path consciousnesses, if you like. So there are those minds that are meditative absorptions, and there are those minds where the Bodhisattva has come out of these meditative absorptions, and there are these non-absorbed states, right? Still not those? No, no. Okay. I, I look it up and I'll ask. I, I just, okay. Did you see it in the chat? No, uh, Dalit sent it. Um, Leora, I put it in uh, the mail because it was something that uh, we discussed in the class, in the ebook class too. So. Never mind, never mind. I, I put it in right in a proper way and then I reset it. Thank you great. so much. Sure. Okay, great. Okay, then the second question is, well, we're about the different boomies, the different grounds. We live in the present in the state of constant change uh, with fragile moments of past, present and future. Um, if we come from, if we assume that we understand everything on the, what we learn here on the theoretical level, is the next step then to understand it on a more intuitive level? And I would say, yes, absolutely. Um, right now, it seems like whatever we learn is far from ourself. It's almost like it's over there and we're learning about it over there. And so, of course, uh, we're trying to become more familiar with it. First of all, understand it better. But then also uh, a sense that it also concerns us. I mean, of course, many of the levels we discuss yet, we are far from, from reaching, but um, still to get a sense of this is a possibility and without talking of the levels, but the kind of emptiness, like emptiness when we describe emptiness, when we describe the different other states of mind, which we can train in right now, yes, becomes a deeper and deeper understanding so that hopefully um, these ideas, the Dharma, becomes very much part of your life. You look at the world through the glasses of the Dharma. So when things change, of course, impermanence, the suffering nature of existence, um, like really like everything, whatever you think of, you see it through the, the eyes of the Dharma. And then it's become intuitive. But of course, with the very high levels that we haven't reached yet, that seems, well, mind boggling. It's like so um, beyond anything that we ordinarily perceive around us. It, it, it's harder to bring it closer to our own experience, but still we get a better, a better understanding. It becomes more intuitive, as you say. I mean, it becomes, it makes more and more sense. We, we don't have to make such an effort to think about it. Um, and in that way, of course, we're more likely to move in the right direction because we kind of know where, know where we're going. So that's uh, question number two. And then number three, what's the next step after we understand this? So after all, oh, so I think it's here concerning emptiness. After all, we'll continue to see our body as if it's solid and stable. Oh, so it's really basically, um, I think the quest second question concerns emptiness. Um, yeah, so whatever theoretical understanding we have, particularly when it comes to emptiness, of course, we need to go over it again and again and again. That's why meditation, I mean, meditation is really, as you all know, it's familiarizing the mind with these ideas. I mean, we're so familiar with anger and attachment because they rise over and over again. So we reinforce them. We continue to be, um, we continuously familiarize the mind and we stop um, familiarizing ourselves well with the afflictive emotions or with the way we look at the world, uh, these minds would lessen. So in this automatic way in which we familiarize with negative aspects, well, we now need to replace them when it comes to, well, emptiness, of course, think about it over and over again, like just as we do with bodhicitta. I mean, I'm not stressing emptiness so much in your daily life because we're not discussing bodhicitta and these aspects. I mean, we're not really discussing them uh, uh, in, in much detail here. So I don't want you to neglect these, these aspects of your practice. But of course, whatever you learn here, you should bring into your daily life. Think over it again and again. It should be part of your meditation. It should be part of your daily life. And then this theoretical idea, it'll slowly transform. It's such it's just the nature of our mind that any kind of abstract theoretical uh, concept, if you think of it over and over again, it'll become an intuitive kind of 
object, if you like. I mean, it becomes much easier. And so he's, he, in terms of the third question, after all, we continue to see our body as if it's solid and stable. Yes, that appearance will continue our body or our mind or anything else. Of course, phenomena still appear to exist inherently. But if you become more and more familiar with it, I mean, not just body and mind, situations as well, other people, if they harm us, if they praise us, whatever happens, to become aware that the I doesn't exist inherently, the, the situation doesn't, and so forth. Now, it continues, it, it'll continue to appear that way. It'll continue to appear all the way up to the 10th ground of a Bodhisattva. In fact, as long as we're not enlightened, these things will continue to appear in that way. But as, for instance, to give you another example, when you look in the mirror, if you look in the mirror, every time what the reflection that appears to you appears to be your face, but you're not at all fooled by it. I mean, you're not acting out of or, or based on that on, on that appearance because you know it's not it's you know it's not you in, in in the mirror. And in a similar way, although things continue to appear as if inherently existent the deeper our understanding as to the lack of inherent existence, the less we'll be fooled by these, fooled by these appearances. Okay. So that's important to understand, but we need to get there and we can only get there if we really make an effort. So if we study this all the time and, you know, study, 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 but don't reflect on it. Well, it's, just, it never becomes intuitive knowledge. All right. Great. And then there's a question by Jimmy, but I, I, I want to answer it next time. I hope that's all right, Jimmy, that I uh, do it next week because I've already spent quite some time on the questions. All right. So um, now to go back to the text, uh, I think we finished the eighth chapter, right? Didn't we finish the eighth chapter? Yeah. All right. Okay. Now, as I also mentioned before, I said, well, um, of course, the Sixth chapter, mainly, we, we, we studied mainly about emptiness, but then the remaining uh, chapters, the remaining verses, they very much give us a sense of the different grounds and levels, grounds and stages, which or levels, which is really important. I mean, an understanding of that is important in so many ways. Uh, I've mentioned one of the uh, importances, one of the benefits of this, which is that um, we get a good sense of where we're going, so we are less likely to go astray. We know what lies ahead, and we can practice accordingly, get a better sense of what is important. Um, but anyway, I thought before we continue with the other verses, I want to give you just a very short, I hope I can do it shortly, I, I can be short, I can be brief about this, what are the what is what are the grounds and path in general all about? So to just say, or to, just to like in this, give you a sense, a, a summary of starting on the first level to Buddhahood, and then just briefly say which of those level marks which path. So I try to keep it really really brief, but to just give you this overview. Um. Of course, we all know Buddha, the, the, the journey to Buddhahood starts with bodhicitta. Of course, yes, it starts with a lot of practices that precede that. But to enter the Mayana path means really to generate the mind of enlightenment. So there's the saying, every journey starts with the first step. Well, from Buddha's point of view, the first step is really generating the mind of enlightenment, that aspiration, or you could change it. The first, the, the, every journey starts with the wish to go somewhere. So that's the aspiration. But of course, we shouldn't forget that this aspiration to actually become enlightened is completely based on love and compassion. So a deep care and compassion. But then the next step is really, well, understanding enlightenment. All right, we want to be enlightened. What is enlightenment? Well, hopefully we've understood that before we aspire to go there. So understanding that there is something that is in the way that is to that needs to be removed 
that is in the way to becoming fully enlightened. And that this can be removed by way of removing its root cause. What is the, what actually is responsible for whatever prevents us from being uh, a Buddha? I mean, we know there are the afflictive emotions, there are uh, certain karmic actions, all that prevents us from becoming fully enlightened. But what is it, what is at its root? And its root is just a basic misapprehension of reality. So how can we remove that basic misapprehension and therefore everything else that it gives rise to by understanding the opposite of that which we wrongly apprehend, which is emptiness. So after we've generated the wish to become enlightened, we need to definitely focus on um, the understanding of emptiness. And as with any understanding, well, it takes some time. We need to reflect upon the, the, the facts on how phenomena exist. And reasoning, logic, is a very helpful tool that helps us to understand what is meant with the lack of inherent existence, which is usually in terms of what we misapprehend is the opposite. All right. So we understand emptiness. Okay. So in the beginning, we generate a conceptual understanding of emptiness. Now, that mind is already quite amazing, but we're not very focused. We're not on top of it. I mean, it's like we, we understand it all right, but we're not going to be able to focus on emptiness all day long. But we're focusing on inherent existence all day long. It's ever present. Our ignorance, our misapprehension is present in all in our daily life, unless we actually meditate on emptiness. But of course, we're so distracted because of our afflictive emotions, because of our misapprehension, so that it's very difficult to make the mind that we, we apprehend this, this, this conceptual understanding, realization of emptiness, uh, be more of a presence in our life so that it can serve as an antidote to whatever prevents us from being enlightened. So we need to generate, we need to develop concentration, a deep state of concentration. And once we've done that, combine it with this conceptual understanding we have of emptiness so that it becomes more of a presence in our daily life. This mind becomes more of a presence in that we can focus for long times on emptiness. So we, we realize emptiness, but then together with this concentration, the mind is very focused on emptiness. Uh, and, and that already becomes more of a presence in that, like I said, emptiness, uh, the ignorance, the misapprehension of reality, self-grasping is, is there in, in every moment, 24 hours a day, even in our dreams, it's there. So this kind of focused mind um, has already a force that can tackle the obstructions. But this mind becomes only really effective once we realize emptiness directly. So that is the next step, to realize emptiness directly. And as I said earlier on, before in one of our previous classes, that is like the vacuum cleaner. That is kind of that which removes the obstructions to enlightenment. However, with regard to these obstructions, first we need to remove obstructions to liberation, and only then can we remove obstructions to enlightenment. So obstructions to liberation, there are those we are born with, the innate ones, and they're the ones <coughs> that on the basis of those uh, obstructions we were born with, we developed in this life. So afflictive emotions, in particular here, the misapprehension of reality, grasping at inherent existence, based on our innate sense that things exist inherently, uh, we develop our own ideas, philosophical, culturally, um, I don't know, culturally influenced ideas of how things exist. Those need to be eliminated first because that's easier. It's only one lifetime that we got used to them or that we familiarized with them. And then come the innate ones. So um, you re remove the, the intellectually acquired ones with a direct with a mind that directly realizes emptiness emptiness we heard about this before that there's this uninterrupted path and the path of release you know in that way so we need to remove that first the intellectually acquired 
um, obstructions to liberation, and then the innate ones. The innate ones, because they've been with us for so long, um, they can only be removed in stages. The intellectually acquired ones are removed in one meditative session. And once they're gone, then all we're left with is the obstructions to enlightenment, which are not the afflictive emotions, the misapprehension of reality, it's none of those. No, it's the imprints that were left, the imprints that were left on the mind, the residues that were left on the mind that still obstruct the mind, even if the afflictive emotions are gone. And now these need to be removed. And once the subtlest of these residues is gone, we have become a Buddha. So that is really the five paths and grounds. They're all about this. And then the path and grounds they describe to you, I mean, they use these, these stages that you go through and say, well, this is the path of accumulation. This is the path of preparation and so forth. All right. So just briefly, um, what marks the path of accumulation? The first path that is marked by the aspiration to become fully enlightened by the mind, the, the spontaneous mind, the mind that does no longer require any effort wanting to become enlightened, want, aspiring to become enlightened for the benefit of all sentient beings. That marks the first moment of the path of uh, accumulation. And then you start, as I said early on, dealing with emptiness, realizing emptiness conceptually. If you haven't realized it yet, you, you work on realizing it on that level and bring it together with concentration, as I also mentioned before. So once you bring, once you have what's called calm abiding, this deep level of concentration, you've combined it with your conceptual realization of emptiness, the first moment you do that, that marks the path of preparation. All right. And then you need to realize emptiness directly, not just conceptually, but directly experience it, like this intuitive, direct experience of the lack of inherent existence. When you have that mind, that marks the path of seeing. All right. And on that level, the path of seeing, the, the mind that realizes emptiness directly, is like I said earlier on, it's like a vacuum cleaner, um, which eliminates the intellectual, intellectually acquired um, obstructions to liberation. All right. So that's your job, the main job. That, you, that a bodhisattva performs, the main task a bodhisattva performs on the path of seeing. And when that is accomplished, well, bodhisattva arises from that meditative absorption and engages in other practices. And when the, the bodhisattva, again, once again, enters in the meditative absorption, uh, realizing emptiness directly, and now eliminates further obscurations, well, he does so eliminating innate obscurations, which are, like I said earlier, innate obscurations to liberation. And when the Bodhisattva enters into a meditative equipoise, that is an uninterrupted path, now eliminating the coarsest of these innate levels, that marks the path of meditation. Okay. And then the Bodhisattva remains on the path of meditation until the last moment the last uninterrupted path uh, in the continuum of a bodhisattva arises, which eliminates the subtlest obscurations, the, obsc the subtlest obscurations to enlightenment. And a moment later, with the path of release um, that is that follows, the bodhisattva has reached the path of no more learning. Okay, so that is as brief as I could do it. Not too bad. 13, 13 minutes, all right, I was able to go through it just to give you um, kind of a rough sense of what the path are all about. And then the grounds, which I haven't mentioned yet, the grounds are a little bit more specific. So as you can tell, the path of seeing and the path of meditation is quite complicated, really, if you have a lot of uh, levels of innate afflictive obscurations or innate afflictions to liberation if you have different levels of them well to mark these different levels you have then um, and to mark also the different levels of the obscurations to enlightenment that also need to be step by step removed in order to mark 
the progress um, going through the, the, the removal of those, you have the 10 grounds, okay? Starting actually with the intellectually acquired ones, the first ground, and then start, then you have the innate ones, the coarser level, uh, and that is described uh, as to, from the point of view. The second level or the second ground, second boomy, whichever we want to call it. And then all the way up to the eighth, of course, where you eliminate, um, where you have, where you, where you actually have eliminated um, the subtlest level of obscurations to liberation. And also start to eliminate uh, the coarser levels of the obscurations, the cognitive obscurations, as they're called, or obscurations to enlightenment. All right. And then again, eighth, ninth, tenth level, you eliminate those and eventually attain the state of a Buddha. And I talked about the uninterrupted path, the path of release last time. No need to go into this again. It's really difficult to say, and it's complicated, and hopefully you've got your notes, um, and you can always go back to that. So anyway, we're not studying grounds and paths, and there's no need to, um, to give you a detailed um, explanation on those. There's also not enough time, because we still need to cover the following vessels. So let's return to the text. We are now, we've now reached the ninth chapter, which of course uh, describes the ninth um, ground. All right. Okay. So the ninth ground, perfect intellect, as it's called. Um, on the ninth ground, so you remember the Bodhisattva has already attained liberation, has eliminated. Um, afflictive obscurations has also um, eliminated the first level, I believe. Yeah, the first level of the uh, obscurations or the um, afflict the the yeah the obscurations to enlightenment, the coarsest level. Um, in terms of the perfections, is the perfection of power. All right. So what does it say on the ninth? So the ninth ground. The Bodhisattva's power becomes perfectly refined. Okay, so on the first ground, of course, generosity became perfectly refined, and then it's ethical conduct all the way to now, of course, uh, the, the eight, ninth level, it's the perfection of power. Um, so on this ground, therefore, um, there are 10 types of power that are described, 10 different types that you'll find in, um, well, at least listed in Lama Tsongkhapa's Illuminating the Intent. Uh, the power of intention, the power of altruistic resolve, the power of retention, and so forth. The power of meditative concentration, the power of perfect resources, uh, power of influence, power of confidence, power of aspiration, power of the perfections, power of great loving kindness, power of the great compassion, and power of the ultimate nature of things. Oh, and then the 13th, the last one, is the power of being blessed by all Tathagatas. Now, as said early on, it's a little difficult to comprehend these powers, for instance, in what way are they different from the powers the Bodhisattva even had earlier? I mean, we, we have powers ourselves, certain powers we do have, of course, they're very limited. But then um, as you continue uh, on the path of the on the different levels, first path, second path, and so forth, of course, you 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 develop certain powers, certain abilities. Um, maybe they they're not yet called powers as such, but certain abilities. And they strengthen, they get stronger and stronger so that a bodhisattva on the ninth level what is different to a bodhisattva on the eighth level, the degree of like the power such a bodhisattva has. So um, power, it has almost like a negative connotation, a powerful person. We, all, we, we, we may think of a person like a, like a tyrant, like a, I don't know, a dictator or whatever, like a powerful person abusing their power, which of course, in the case of a bodhisattva is not the case. I mean, powerful if you think actually and it's honest i think it's, it's a very good example so this homeless the Dalai Lama is actually very powerful i mean definitely in the buddhist uh context in the buddhist world uh what his homeless says 
carries a lot of weight. Um, and despite, I mean, that influence, of course, as homelessness has, but just if, if you, if, of course, when we, when we encounter homeless for the first time, as homeless is very kind and very smiling. So it doesn't maybe, it's maybe not that obvious the very first time, but if you spend some time with this one, it's this incredible mental strength and this power affecting people in such an incredible way. So it's that kind of power, like really having the power of the power of his words, the power of his actions, the power of his mind. Um, and so here is described here in tension, in terms of intention, altruistic resolve, retention. I mean, the power of remembering things. And oftentimes it's homeless manifests, of course, in the way, oh, I don't remember, I don't remember. But then there are other times, oh, very clear. I mean, definitely, I mean, the way his homeless manifests is very different to uh, his homeless actual powers of retention. Meditative concentration, of course, we don't have the fortune to really be, be aware of this incredible concentration his homeless has. But anyway, there's no doubt his homeless has, has got them. Uh, it's got this incredible uh, ability so anyway power of influence i've already spent power of confidence oh so much confidence aspiration the motivation and so forth so loving kindness so incredible power so getting a sense on that level on the ninth level and which is so like i said it's mind-boggling to just try and fathom just trying to understand um the the incredible yeah, these these powers, it's, it's it's beyond our capacity, really. But we're making an effort here. So yes, on the ninth level, therefore, the 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 main the main practice of the perfections is that power. This is what becomes surpassing, or becomes um, yeah, it's it's uh, it's it's one of the it's one of, the, of the different perfections. It really is power that stands out. Okay, and then it goes on to say, so uh, what is it? So the Bodhisattva therefore attains the spotless qualities. So just as in the case of the perfection of power, uh, the Bodhisattva also attains the spotless qualities of the four kinds of perfect knowledge. Okay, so it mentions the powers and it mentions also something else, something else that the Bodhisattva attains on the ninth level. What is it? Four kinds of perfect knowledge. I went through them previously as part of the unshared qualities of a Buddha. Uh, you may remember I briefly went through these different qualities that are typical for a Buddha uh, or that are qualities only found in the continuum of a Buddha, which is why these four kinds of perfect knowledge, which are actually part of the un these unshared qualities, well, they're just similitudes of those. So similitudes in that they're very similar to the four, perf the four kinds of perfect knowledge that a Buddha has, but there's not exactly the same. Anyway, they're mentioned as special qualities on the uh, ninth level. And you may remember um, these four kinds of perfect no kinds of knowledge are knowledge of the Dharma, of the meaning of the Dharma, the meaning of the different terms, and a knowledge of the limitless confidence that the Bodhisattva has. So knowledge of his or her own confidence. So that is usually how these four are described. So the Dharma, the different Dharmas, uh, you could say that the, the Dharmas in the sense of not Dharma, just the teachings, but Dharma of any phenomenon that exists. And then it's meaning and the different etymological meanings like what the terms referring to them actually mean and of course knowledge of confidence there's one way of looking at it that way or the dharma as the teachings the dharma of the understanding of its meaning the understanding of all the different terms that are used to describe this meaning and again understanding of confidence so there are different ways of describing these four and i guess you could say that a bodhisattva has all of them has all of these uh, qualities of, of knowledge. Um, in the in the auto commentary, 
Actually, Chandrakirti describes them slightly differently, but Laman Tsongkhapa mentions the explanation that I just gave, plus the one from Chandrakirti's commentary, which again, it could just mean that on top of the qualities that have already been described, the Bodhisattva also has the ones that I'm going to describe now. So of the four kinds of perfect knowledge, the way Chandrakirti explains them in his other commentaries, the first one, the Bodhisattva knows the specific characteristics of each phenomenon. So whatever phenomenon the Bodhisattva knows, the Bodhisattva knows the specific characteristics of those. Um, the second one, knowing the differentiations among all the attributes of all phenomena. Um, and then with the third, he knows how to speak about these phenomena without confusion. And with the fourth, knows without any ga gaps, the continuum of the causes of these phenomena, of these phenomena. So, of course, this is just a similitude of them. The four kinds of perfect knowledge refer to, yeah, a Buddha knows all the characteristics of whatever exists. And there's all the differences, the differ differentiations amongst all these attributes, knows how to describe, to speak about these phenomena without any confusion. And lastly, knows about the continuum of these causes, of concordant causes of these phenomena. So Buddha knows all these, of course, that's part of the omniscient mind of a Buddha, but a Bodhisattva has a similitude, has qualities that come really close to those just described. Anyway, they're mentioned in uh, Chandakirti's text. So there's really not much more to say on the, for the ninth level. So on the ninth level, just to say it again, uh, the Bodhisattva attains the surpassing perfection of, uh, or his practice is surpassing when it comes to the perfection of power, um, as well as uh, attaining the similitude of these four kinds of perfect knowledge. Um, and um, uh, as of course, as, even if it's not mentioned here, the Bodhisattva eliminates uh, again a certain level of cognitive obscurations, that is obscurations to enlightenment, moving closer towards the state where all these obscurations are gone. So that is the ninth level. And then as to the 10th level, the, that is described as the cloud of Dharma. Um, here it says on the 10th ground, he or, well, they or she, the Bodhisattva, anyway, will receive the supreme empowerment of great light from all the Buddhas. Okay, so this should not be confused with the tantric explanation of receiving an empowerment. You've probably heard, for instance, that um, from a tantric point of view, it is not possible to become fully enlightened unless a practitioner practices tantra. But of, you can actually um, reach the 10th ground of a bodhisattva without practicing tantra. It's just not possible to become fully enlightened. So there are practitioners who practice Tantra right from the beginnings, go through the path of accumulation, path of preparation, and so forth, by way of practicing Tantra. And then also, of course, on the basis of having previously um, practiced the Sutra, having the basis in the Sutra um, practices, having the basis of that. And then based on that, definitely with regard to the three, so renunciation, bodhicitta, and the view of emptiness as described in the um, principal aspects of the path. So having a, um, a good foundation in those, a practitioner may then enter the tantric path and based on that attain the enlightenment of the Buddha. But it's also possible not to go through the path and grounds, um, as I just said, through practicing tantra, but through practicing the sutric um, well, engaging the sutric practices, practicing the teaching according to sutras, we're studying it here, um, according to the sutras or the sutric uh, vehicle. In that case, from a tantric point of view, you can get all the way to the 10th ground. It takes longer, but it's possible. However, then that last step to, well, 
reach from the 10th ground to reach the full enlightenment of the Buddha, you need to practice Tantra. That's the Tantric explanation. And if you were able to reach the 10th ground without practicing Tantra, now you need to receive initiation empowerment by um, the Buddhas, the Buddha, a Buddha or the Buddhas. You need to be empowered to then, to then, well, I'd be authorized to be authorized to have the permission to practice tantra, and then very quickly a bodhisattva reaches the tenth, uh, reaches the state of a Buddha, Buddhahood. That's tantra, and so the word empowerment is reached. The uh, so the empowerment is given on the tenth ground. That is mentioned in the tantra path, but that's not what's what's meant here. So it's not like Chandrakirti is now suddenly talking about tantra. No. It's a kind of empowerment that is a kind of blessing, a different, a certain kind of blessing uh, given by the Buddhas, uh, those who've already become enlightened, blessing the mind of the Bodhisattva on the tenth level in a um, in a very specific, in a in a very effective way, so that um, that that becomes one of the causes for the Buddhist the Bodhisattva to become enlightened. Of course, then you could debate like why why does he need a blessing now? Wouldn't have been received the blessing before that? Um, what is so special about it? Actually, in the tenth ground sutra, it says it's more like a type of con- uh, concentration. So yeah, there's definitely that blessing, but there's also a, a, a specific type of concentration that a bodhisattva reaches on that level. So. It's probably both. I mean, there's this blessing, receiving the supreme empowerment, and then also re- giving rise or rece- receiving the supreme blessing, um, and then of course, and also because of that, then also uh, reaching this specific kind of concentration, a, 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 um, a special level of concentration. But anyway, this is like. Like I think I mentioned this before, it becomes really difficult to really understand what is the ninth ground about? What is the tenth ground about? In the beginning, it was seemed much easier, at least. Like I said, it's so beyond our understanding. It's so hard to fathom what all this means. Um, it was almost much, I mean, almost, yeah, well, to a certain degree, easier to talk about the first ground, the second ground. It was much more graspable, like this is what happens. On this level, it becomes much harder on the 10th level, this empowerment and so forth. Anyway, let's look, well, let's check what Chandakirti says. So on the 10th ground, the Bodhisattva will receive supreme empowerment from all the Buddhas. Okay. And his superior gnosis, gnosis or his superior um, primordial wisdom will reach here its perfection as well. So this gnosis or, or well, supreme um, wisdom. Remember, I talked about the two types of wisdom in Tibetan. There are different words, shedap and yeshi. So shedap uh, focuses, well, in some commentaries, it talks about focus. The main focus is on emptiness. Yeshi, it's like having realized emptiness, the focus is more on conventional truth. There's that. But it's also that shedap. Um, is is there's more of a when it comes to share, but it's more like that. It's, it's more based on reasoning through analysis, through uh, discerning the different phenomena. Uh, share up arises. I mean, share of wisdom, even if it's a direct realization of emptiness, but then that direct realization of emptiness deepens further, becomes even more intuitive, you may say, and it, it eventually. It, it becomes this kind of yeshi, so this uh, primordial wisdom, as it's sometimes uh, described. Uh, yeah. Anyway, it's, um, it's it's it seems much. It's like a deeper kind of wisdom, really. So this is what is reached on the tenth ground. So of the ten perfections, the last perfection is the perfection of wisdom. That is, well, yeshi or primordial wisdom. So this this is the superior gnosis gnosis or gnosis as Tuvdin Jimba translates the term yeshi here 
superior wisdom or superior gnosis will reach here its perfection as well. So the 10 perfections, that's what the Bodhisattva reaches. Uh, that, that's what the first two lines tell us. And then the third line, as a heavy downpour descends from water-laden clouds, that explains why it's just why it's called the cloud of Dharma. Um, so actually, in all of the verses of each chapter, they always explain the name, why it's called here in this case, case cloud of Dharma. Previously, it was perfect intellect. Uh, I think I forgot to mention that. I didn't mention that. Yeah, so when I said the four kinds of perfect knowledge, um, that explains why it's called the um, perfect intellect, the, the ninth ground. And the tenth ground is called cloud of Dharma. So explained here in the third line, third and fourth line of uh, verse 10, as a heavy downpour descends from water-laden clouds. All right, so that's the analogy, the metaphor given. If you think of dry weather in India and for the crops to, to uh, grow properly and, and well, yield the, the result that you're hoping for, you need these water-laden clouds. So similarly here, the teachings of a bodhisattva on the ninth ground um, are like these water-laden clouds, um, quality-laden, so filled with qualities. And from him, the Dharma rain will fall freely to water the crop of being's virtues. All right, so um, being able to teach in a very... Um, in a, in a very specific or in a special way that is so special that is noted here. Of course, on all the levels, the Bodhisattva is able to teach, give incredible teaching, but that improves, of course, until a Buddha, of course, the Buddha gives the best teachings or most beneficial teaching. Um, that's why we're aiming to become a Buddha. But here it's mentioned just one level before Buddhahood. Wow, these incredible teachings that are like this, water-laden clouds, so cloud of dharma, teaching the dharma in this very effective way, and, <clears throat> and therefore, um, yeah, being also, the, that's why the, the name is given to this ground. So with the six perfections, it all makes sense to us to a certain degree. We're so familiar with them. And of course, we've heard that the last four per perfections, the perfection of um, skillful means, the perfection of aspiration or prayer, the perfection of power, and the perfection of, um, of uh, primordial wisdom or superior gnosis, if you like, that those are actually all part of the sixth perfection. We've already heard that, but different, slightly different variations, if you like. So having practiced mainly in, um, like I said, skillful means, then aspirations, then power and now teaching so important that's that's why it's so important to become a buddha because a buddha guides teaches sentient beings and therefore just before buddhahood that quality that specific quality is once again mentioned because it's the highest level in terms of teaching abilities that a sentient being can attain all right so that explains therefore um the verse of the 10th chapter like it's just one verse so among the 10 perfections therefore the superior gnosis of the bodhisattva here becomes perfectly refined and and here i'm just using uh, lama Tsongkhapa's commentary so just as a heavy downpour descends from water-laden clouds to help nurture the crops of worldly beings or worldly people this is the analogy or the metaphor so from him, this son of conquerors on the 10th ground, this bodhisattva, the Dharma rain will fall freely to water the crop of being's virtue. This, is, this ground is therefore called cloud of Dharma. So that concludes the 10th chapter. Now we've got one chapter to go. What time is it? Time is it? Just one sec. All right, we're good with the time. So let's start the... the um last chapter now the last chapter um especially the first verses is really difficult to give you much explanation 
Um, because in most of the commentaries, there's not much given. Anyway, um, I'll explain as much as I can, using again, illuminating the intent, of course, by Lama Tsongkhapa. What is done is here, first, so the last chapter, Qualities of the Ten Grounds, well, as the title tells you, it tells you, it gives you a brief overview of the Ten Grounds, Mm, and then it talks about the resultant ground. All right, so let's look at verses one, two, three. This tells us the qualities on the first ground. Okay, so on the first ground of the ultimate awakened mind, um, so the, as you remember, um, it's really what the first chapter talks about. It talks about the first ground, which is also described as bodhicitta, but ultimate bodhicitta, okay, on the first ground, you attain ultimate bodhicitta, which is, what is ultimate bodhicitta, just to remind you, it is a mind that directly realizes emptiness and is conjoined with bodhicitta, okay, so it's attained on the path of seeing, yeah, on the path of seeing, That's when you attain ultimate bodhicitta. So it's not just a direct realization of emptiness. It's not just that you have bodhicitta, but you have bodhicitta that equals the strength of at least the path of meditation. Because you can actually, you can actually realize, you you can have a direct realization of emptiness that is conjoined with bodhicitta but it's, that is in the continuum of a bodhisattva who has not yet reached the path of C, okay? Because you can have gone through the path, you can have gone, kind of gone through the Hinayana path, through the, uh, the hero or solitary realizer path, which means you must have realized emptiness. You can't reach liberation through the Hinayana path without realizing emptiness directly. But once you've gone through this path and you enter the Mahayana path, Well, you have bodhicitta and you have the direct realization of emptiness because you don't lose that. However, you don't, you haven't yet reached the path of seeing. So then there's a little bit of debate. So if you haven't reached the path of seeing, like, what do you need? What is, you've already removed the affliction of emotions. I mean, you've removed the afflictions to liberation. So why don't you go right away to the eighth ground? Actually, this is, Definitely something you could debate. I mean, there's an answer to that. But if you've gone through, you know, you've reached self-liberation first, which is a possibility. It just takes a little longer. So you go through that and then enter the Mayana path. And why it takes longer, it's a whole different debate. But anyway, so you go through the Mayana, the Hinayana path and then go enter the Mayana path. Well, wouldn't you be on the eighth ground already because you eliminate the afflictive obscurations? Well, no, you still go to, through the path of accumulation, the path of preparation, the path of seeing. But whatever, the, the, when previously in the other scenario where you don't go through the Hinayana path, but enter the Mayana path from the outset, in this case, it's clearly laid out in terms of your understanding of emptiness, you've reached such and such levels, so you're on the path of preparation, okay? You have have attained the union of calm abiding and special insight realizing emptiness. Conceptually, marks the path of preparation, bodhisattva path of preparation. You realize emptiness directly for the first time, it marks the uh, Mahayana path of seeing, and so forth. Now, if you already have all these qualities, you have the union of combining special insight, realizing emptiness, realizing emptiness directly. So how do you now differentiate between path of preparation, path of seeing, path of what, what, what's the difference between them? It's all from the point of view of method. It's from the point of view of the strength of the, the, the mind of enlightenment, because there's a mind of enlightenment, there's bodhicitta, that accords with the path of preparation, that accords with the path of seek. They have to be strengthened as well, these minds, these different levels of them, of, of love, compassion. So the method aspects, they all have to be strengthened. So the wisdom has been taken care of, but just wisdom is not enough. It's important to 
as the Bodhisattva uh, um, kind of evolves, if you like, although wisdom plays less of a part in this case, I mean, it's still there and it's still important, but the Bodhisattva mainly has to focus on, as I said, uh, love, compassion, and so forth. And so there is love that accords with the path of preparation. If that is attained, then you're on the path of preparation. There's love that corresponds to the path of uh, seeing. If you reach that, then you're on the path of seeing. Although wisdom, all that, you've already gone through uh, while you were on the Hinayana path. So I've added this complication, sorry for that, but might as well mention it, um, makes things more complicated. So no surprise, we study in so much detail because there are different scenarios and it's good to be aware of them. But anyway, without um, wanting to, to um, confuse you, now going back to what I initially said, therefore, um, here what I mentioned previously in terms of the, the first three verses. So on the first ground, you have the ultimate awakening mind. Because I said before, you can have a direct realization of emptiness. You can have bodhicitta. But it doesn't mean, although the two are conjoined, it doesn't mean you have ultimate bodhicitta. Ultimate bodhicitta you only have if you have a, 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 a a type of bodhicitta that, is, that its strength, which it's the, the, it's no the strength of which is the strength that you need on the path of seeing. Like I said, on the path of seeing, the the method aspects they have also a certain strength, but you cannot put them into words. I mean, other than saying the strength of the love and compassion of a bodhisattva that accords with the path of seeing. Okay, so a person, even someone who has gone through the Hinayana path, has realized emptiness a long time ago. Well, if they're on the path of preparation, realizing having the mind that realizes emptiness directly, that is influenced, conjoined with bodhicitta, that is not ultimate bodhicitta, right? Ultimate bodhicitta is really then when the bodhisattvas. Bodhicitta has become so strong that it that it that it um, has the level of strength that is typical for the path of seeing when it comes to bodhicitta, and then is conjoined with and then influences uh, the direct realization of emptiness and the direct realization of emptiness influences that kind of bodhicitta influence in the sense enhances it. Only then you, do you talk of ultimate bodhicitta. Okay, I hope I didn't confuse you too much. Uh, but anyway, it's an important aspect that we've definitely learned about. So anyway, uh, whatever it is, whether you've reached the, uh, the Mayana, whether you reach, whether you entered the Mayana path from the outset or whether you first uh, reached first practiced the Hinayana uh, path and became enlightened, uh, became liberated, and then entered the Mayana path. The point is here, once you reach the path of seeing, once you reach ultimate bodhicitta, what can you do? You see instantly in a single moment, a hundred Buddhas, okay? So everything is from now on a hundred. Now we shouldn't take it too literally. When in Tibetan, when in Sanskrit, when they said a hundred it didn't literally uh, mean a hundred in that, like not one more and not one less. It's just a number that is given that expresses a lot. I mean, they're not, it, it's not necessary to know exactly which number it is. Could be a little more, a little less. I really can't say, but um, so a hundred doesn't necessarily have to be taken literally, but let's, Take it for now, just because it's easier to say. So the Buddhas, a Bodhisattva sees instantly a hundred Buddhas, a lot of Buddhas. I mean, we could just see one. Um, you, you may be familiar with the fact that uh, even when Buddha Shakyamuni was around, not everyone had the karma to see Buddha Shakyamuni, perceive the Buddha as a Buddha. Uh, that's also an aspect as well. I mean, just seeing the Buddha as an ordinary person and not realizing the qualities of the Buddha. So 
right now they could be Buddhas around us. We could perceive them, but we're not able to benefit from seeing a Buddha simply because we're not aware of their, their qualities or the fact even that they're special. Okay, So here a, a, a Bodhisattva on that level knows they're actually perceiving a Buddha, a Buddha and not just one, but so many. And so in that way, that's a special quality. Knows as well that it's being blessed by all these hundred Buddhas. Okay, so being blessed by receiving whatever kind of comes from, what is this blessing anyway? It's really, we use this word, what does that actually mean? I, I'm sure many of you know that blessing actually means to transform something in some, into something greater. So there's something, some power coming from, from the Buddhas uh, in this case that helps us to transform into something greater. So of course we have to do all the work, but that doesn't mean that there's no help coming from uh, the Buddhas. And so, yeah, blessing in whichever form they help us to transform into something greater comes from the side of the Buddha is that which we call blessing. Okay. So, and so being aware of being blessed by a hundred Buddhas. That's the second point. And at that point, um, the Buddha, a Bodhisattva is able, like a lifespan of enduring for a hundred eons. Okay, so being able to perceive all these Buddhas, being knowing, being blessed by them, and knowing, well, we're also blessed by, by Buddhas, definitely, but um, receiving this blessing and knowing, being aware of it, and then remaining for 100 eons. Actually, to have a really long life, I mean, it's great, because the problem is, I mean, our lives are so short, really. Uh, we finally got it figured out. We have a better understanding. We don't make the same mistakes as we used to, and then we die. I mean, I'm not saying we all become wiser as we grow older. I'm not saying we don't make the same mistakes. But in general, to have a sense, have a longer life, we can accomplish much more. So that's definitely a huge um, advantage. And it goes on to say, the Bodhisattva will know perfectly what came before and what will follow. And so in the commentary says that, Having knowledge, I mean, we would maybe call it kind of a higher perception or clairvoyant abilities, knowing what happened. And they say, Amatokapa says, like, in the commentary, it says, like, in the past, knowing of the past, 100 eons in the past and 100 eons in the future. And again, in terms of what is to come, what was in the past, can you imagine? Uh, even just having that knowledge now, how different our lives would be because we can uh, prepare accordingly, but also learn from past mistakes. All right. So this is all very abstract and a little bit difficult to wrap our mind around. Um, so we, it needs some getting used to. Uh, and I'll stop here, of course. Oh, oh gosh, I've, I've really gone for a long time. I'll stop here, of course. But um, I want you to get more of a feeling for this. And it's not just some kind of abstract fairy tale kind of idea. Um, so of course, this is up to you to get a sense. You actually see Buddhas and appreciate their qualities. You actually um, get blessed and so forth. Um, so to really get a sense for what that means, that it's more graspable and graspable in the sense that it affects us uh, such that we feel I want to reach that level. That's amazing. Okay. But the best time to do that would, of course, then to meditate on it. So let's do that. Okay. My apologies. I've gone a little bit longer than I intended to. But anyway, got some time left um, for meditation. So today that, that we covered a lot. So let's first take a moment to just let go of any, any confusion, exhaustion and so forth and just focus on the breath. On the breath.
in order to get a sense of what it means to reach at least the first ground. According to Chandatirti's description here, well, our understanding of emptiness will be such that it's conjoined with calm abiding and directly realizes emptiness. And it is conjoined with the mind of enlightenment. That has a special strength that is typical for the path of seeing. Now this ultimate mind helps us or enables us to perceive a hundred Buddhas. Be in the presence of enlightened beings knowing that there are enlightened. not just having the sense that they're ordinary, a sense that most people have, even when they're in the presence of a Buddha. Also on that level, we receive the blessings of all these hundred Buddhas and are aware of those blessings. Blessings and the formal feeling joyful just thinking of these Buddhas. And feeling deeply inspired. By the qualities. and by their actions of body, speech, and mind.
And on that ground, we also have an extremely long life, a life that spends a hundred eons. Being able to accomplish so much more. And we're able to accomplish our short life right now. And of course, it comes with this higher perception. Or knowledge. Of the events that happened in the past, that is for the past hundred eons. and the events that will unfold in the future. In the next hundred eons. knowledge which once again helps us greatly to progress in our practice. And of course, on that first ground, we have completely removed all intellectually acquired aspirations to liberation. So even though due to our ordinary, limited sense of ourselves and others, all this may be hard to believe, hard to fathom. to the, the power and the potential of our mind. We can reach such a state, but even greater states that go far beyond that. If 
regenerate the aspiration to do so and engage in the, in the practices. method and wisdom. So now to conclude this short analysis, whatever insight or whatever conclusion you have come to. Take a few moments to single-pointedly focus on them. And then let's dedicate whatever positive potential we've accumulated together, meditating, learning about this particular text. May this become calls for us to ourselves be able to enter the path and grounds and eventually become fully enlightened for the welfare of all sentient beings. May this also be a cause for our Lamas are great masters like as home as the Dalai Lama to have a healthy and long, long life so that they continue to teach us through their example and their words. And may, of course, our virtue also reduce the suffering in this world and bring other sentient beings more peace and happiness. May it help those like Geshe Kunsok and Tali Lubin and everyone else who is sick to quickly get better. May it reduce hatred, a greed, and all the other destructive qualities in the minds of those responsible for all the armored conflicts in this world taking place right now. Of course, become a cause for the end of all these conflicts. And may it affect may have an effect the way Shantideva describes it. May all beings everywhere, plagued by sufferings of body and mind, obtain an ocean of happiness and joy by virtue of my merits. May no living creature suffer, commit evil or ever fall ill. May no one be afraid or belittled with a mind weighed down by depression. May the blind see forms and the deaf hear sounds. May those whose bodies are worn with toil be restored on finding repose. May the naked find clothing, the hungry find food. May the thirsty find water and delicious drinks. May the poor find wealth, 
Those weak with sorrow find joy. May the forlorn find hope, constant happiness and prosperity. May there be timely rains and bountiful harvests. May all medicines be effective and wholesome prayers bear fruit. May all who are sick and ill quickly be freed from their ailments. Whatever diseases there are in the world, may they never occur again. May the frightened cease to be afraid and those bound be freed. May the powerless find power and may people think of benefiting each other. For as long as space remains, for as long as sentient beings remain, until then may I too remain to dispel the miseries of the world. All right, thank you. Uh, okay, so just to remind you, of course, your focus should be again bodhicitta. Of course, it should be wisdom as well, but don't need to mention that. But then with regard to method, so bodhicitta combined with an understanding of the suffering nature of ourselves and others. And then have a great week. Be safe and I'll see you again next Sunday. Thank you. Thank you so much, Thank you. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Dharma Friends of Israel. Good night. Thank you.